Psalm 118 is a psalm of a king, a king who leads his people in praise, a king who calls his people to trust, a king who fights for the people in battle. But as you read through this psalm, it's obviously not just a psalm of any old king. It's also a psalm of the king, a psalm of Jesus Christ himself. A psalm of the one who, verse 5, when he was hard pressed in the garden, cried out to the Lord. A psalm of the one who in that same garden, verses 6 and 7, knew the Lord's presence and protection. Jesus is the one, verses 16 to 18, who experienced the might of the Lord's right hand in the tomb so that he could say, I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. It's a psalm of the one who, after he rose from the grave, he ascended into heaven as if in response to the request of verse 19. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. As we read Psalm 118, it's almost as if we hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us. But as we come to verse 22, the psalm changes tack. No longer is the king speaking to his people. Now his people are speaking about the king. And in Psalm 118, they say of their king what Peter will later say of the king hundreds of years later. Verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And in Psalm 118, they acclaim their king with shouts that will be heard hundreds of years later on Palm Sunday, as the crowds welcomed King Jesus into the royal city of Jerusalem. In verse 25, they shout, Lord, save us. Or, as we're more used to hearing uh, from the original Hebrew, Hosanna. Then they cry, verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118 is a psalm about a king, but it is also profoundly a psalm about the king. And yet while there were all sorts of similarities between the two kings, there are also some differences. So in verse 10, we read that the original king of Psalm 19 cut down the nations in the name of the Lord. Whereas the king, our king, was cut down for the sake of the nations in the name of the Lord. In verse 14, we read that the Lord became the salvation of the original king. But the king, our king, is the one who is our salvation as the Lord. He The Lord come as our King is the one who saves. Jesus is so clearly lifted high by this psalm that the instructions that bookend it almost don't need to be said. We almost don't need to hear the instruction, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. But it's as if we need reminding, it's true and we should praise him for it. Well, as well as instructing us to give thanks to the Lord, the psalm also encourages us to take refuge in the Lord. Or with King Jesus in mind, to to claim the fact that we are in Christ. And while it's true that this may mean we face some of the anguish, some of the opposition that he experienced. It also means that as we share in his sufferings, we will share in his victory. That in him we can, we will enter through the gates of the righteous into the presence of the Lord. We're to take refuge in him. And that taking refuge in the Lord will work itself out in all sorts of ways. But it's picked up in the New Testament in the letter to the Hebrews. And there the author applies it in two strikingly contemporary ways. 
as he wraps up that letter. In the final chapter, he uses verses 6 and 7 from Psalm 118 to call us to marital fidelity and financial contentment. He says, in effect, the Lord has been faithful to us. His love endures forever so we can be faithful to one another. And because he is with us, we have all we need. We need not chase after financial gains. We can be content in him. Well, that's how the author of the letter to the Hebrews applies that verse about finding refuge in the Lord. Let me leave you with a question to ponder as I finish. How could taking refuge in the Lord, how could claiming our status as those in Christ help you in other areas of life? Have a think and pile in with comments below.